Welcome to K9 Revolution Radio. Presented by K9 Revolution Dog Training. Enhancing the dog and owner relationship through education, balance, and pack instinct. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Canine Revolution Radio. I'm your host, Chad. we got Chris and Kevin, as usual. And uh, today we're talking about a very important topic, learning theory. Chris is saying that uh, most people are going to tune out in this episode, and I'm saying they're not. This is I super mean, we important. we got to keep it interesting. This is super important. So I, mean, I didn't say that, that it's not important. <laughs> <laughs> you said they're going to tune out. No, no. All right, guys, prove Chris wrong. Stay with us the whole time as we get through this material. This is super important if you want to learn and understand how your dog learns, right? So the, the purpose of this material we're going to go through today, canine learning theory, is so that we can understand the science and the application behind learning theory that applies to mammals, specifically canines, right? And so the, uh, the majority of what we're going through today is one of the first lessons Bless you. One of the first lessons that our uh, trainer apprentices will go through when they first uh, come through our apprenticeship program because it's the basis of how we're going to start working with and training dogs, right? So in this lesson, in this uh, podcast, we're going to go through several pieces of learning theory. Number one being classical conditioning. Number two being operant conditioning. We're going to go through some other things observational learning we're going to define what escape and avoidance training is we'll probably get, in, get into some terminology but let's dive right in ben's already making faces no, making faces <laughs> all right so hang out happier <laughs> the first <laughs> <laughs> the first thing we need to understand is classical conditioning right and i'm not going to go into all the details of uh the background of classical conditioning but basically uh classical conditioning means that uh something comes before uh, some type of reinforcement, right? So in classical conditioning, there's going to be some type of stimuli that comes before some type of what is called a primary reinforcer, right? And so if we pair these two things over a period of time, the stimuli itself, the meaningless stimuli, is going to equal in the mammal or the dog's mind what that primary reinforcer is, right? So let me tell a quick story. Ivan Pavlov, the uh, person who discovered classical conditioning, you know, he discovered it by actually he was studying the, you know, the digestion of food and dogs. So during his experiments, he actually stumbled upon classical conditioning and realized that uh, the dogs began to uh, salivate at the sign of the technicians who were coming in to feed the dogs so they could study the digestion, right? So basically they had a lab, lab set up, dogs are in an area, the technicians walk in to give them their dog food, you know, the dog get the food, the dogs get the food. After a certain number of repetitions, this is gonna be hundreds of times typically, the dogs see the people walk in with their food they're already salivating because in their brain, they're, they're getting the food. Does that kind of make sense? So uh, then what he did was he kind of got rid of the technicians. He created automatic feeders. And right before he would feed the dogs, he would sound a tone, you know, ring of a bell, something like that. He would sound the tone. A few moments later, the food would be released by the automatic feeder to the dog. And again, after repetitions, when that bell was rung, the dogs would already begin salivating like they had food, even though they didn't have food yet. Right. So that's super important uh, to kind of wrap your brain around that, that thing that meant nothing to the dog, the tone, the tone of the ring of the bell actually became, uh, in the dog's mind, like they were getting food. Does that kind of make sense? Yes. Did I, did I overcomplicate that? <laughs> you guys think no. ad guys make it more simple for people? No, that was no. good. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, you're basically connecting, you know, the dogs hear this bell. Now, all of a sudden, like, okay, let's say food. Food is a very positive thing to most of us, right? So now we hear this bell. We're connecting it with food. So eventually you can even, with, with food not in the picture, you're having, you're, you're having a chemical response in your body that's pleasurable, that's associated with the food. Right. Right. So that bell has been classically conditioned. Right. Right. And so, you know... Pavlov did a ton of different variations of the experiment. He found 
a couple of things that are important to note as well. If the tone sounded at the same time the food was given, classical conditioning was not mm. achieved. Super important. Mm. Super important. Right? Mm. Has to come right before it. Right? If the tone sounded during the time the dogs were already eating, classical conditioning was not achieved. So meaning the tone cannot come after the food. Right? Classical conditioning can only be achieved if the stimuli, the tone in this case, predicts or precedes the primary reinforcer, which is the food. He, he did some more experiments with some variables of this, and he consistently found that timing was extremely important. The less delay there was between the stimuli and the reinforcer, the tone and the food, the faster and the stronger the classical conditioning was achieved. If he waited too long between stimuli, tone, and primary reinforcer, food, classical conditioning was not achieved. So what that means is the tone cannot come at the same time as the food. The tone cannot come after the food, right? The tone cannot predict the food too long, right? You can't give the tone, wait for a minute, and then give the food, right? It has to be tone, pause, food, okay? Good to go with that, right? Uh, he did a bunch of tests, and basically he found that uh, one half second was the preferred time for classical conditioning, right, in order to achieve that. Um, but bottom line, we're going to use this in a variety of points in training with our dogs, and our dogs are actually, this is happening to them whether or not we like it all the time. But whatever it is, whatever that stimuli is, in this case it's tone, and whatever your reinforcer is, in this case it's food, you have to follow the sequence, tone, pause, food. Tone, pause, food. And you have to do that for repetition, 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 repetition in order to achieve classical conditioning. Let's take another example. Doorbell, pause, mm. someone comes Intruder. in. Intruder. Yep. <laughs> Doorbell, pause, someone comes in. Mm. Doorbell, pause, someone comes in. Over time, guess what? That doorbell means the dog's just jumping up, running to the door, slamming into the door. Mm -hmm. Like that Frenchie we just trained, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so like that's just an example. Classical conditioning is happening all the time, mm -hmm. whether you like it or not. You sometimes put, against you. Sometimes it's working it, against you. A lot of times it's working against yeah. you. A lot of times, you know, yeah. you put your baby in the baby seat, you're feeding the baby, food falls on the floor. So soon dog begins to associate Baby and baby seat equals food on the floor, right? Or what if most like people, that. you go and you grab your leash, what happens? Mm -hmm. Leash, pause, yeah. walk. Leash, yeah. pause, walk. Leash, pause, walk. Leash, pause. So you got to break that sequence, you mm -hmm. know, to work on some of these things mentally with the dog. You know what I'm saying? That's one of the things we do. We figure out what the root of a problem is and we break the sequence, right? So we can break the classical conditioning for whatever the issue is, rebuild it the way we want it done, right? So... Any other examples that are pretty common, you know? Uh, uh, I mean, well, same thing with Pavlov, but like feeding time. Yep. You know, I feed at 6 p.m., 5.59, my dogs are like ready to go in their kennels. They're making a little bit of noise, you yep. know, so they have that conditioning down. Mm -hmm. Not exactly a negative thing there, you yeah. know, they, yeah. just, they just know the schedule. You know? I mean, sometimes, you know, we talked about, we've talked about separation anxiety. Sometimes you're doing the same things before you leave the house. You're mm -hmm. putting on these stimuli, mm -hmm. right, where I'm grabbing my keys or I'm, you know, doing the same, putting the sh my shoes on at the same location or something like that. And that can be a classically conditioned response to, boom, my dog's got anxiety. Right. Or you greet somebody, the dog jumps on them. Yep. Someone <laughs> comes over, you jump on them. Someone comes over, you jump on them. It's just a repeated sequence, you know, classically conditioned that the way you greet somebody is by jumping on them, which is a problem for a lot of people. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah. saying? <clears throat> and it starts when they're a puppy. And it's right. cute when they're a puppy. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? Then, oh, but, good, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you're reinforcing it yeah. even more. And, you know. yeah, then the dog gets older. I can't get him to stop. Yep, now yeah. it's a problem. And then it's a strong habit at that point. Right. You know what I'm saying? So that's classical conditioning. So I hope that makes sense to you guys, you listeners out there. But the way we're going to use this in training is preferably for us, we're going to use it uh, – for what we call verbal markers, which are a communication system. So like if a dog's doing the right thing, we'll say good, pause, provide a reward, food reward or something like that. Okay. Uh, same thing on the opposite end of the spectrum. If they're disobeying us, no, pause, correction, right? Mm -hmm. And as we go through that, we do it repetitiously. Pretty soon, good to the dog, the word good equals the reward. 
so then we don't have to give a reward all the time and then no equals a correction and if we do it consistently and effectively you know then we won't always have to give a correction because our word no has been classically conditioned to equal a correction right so super important to wrap your brain around but like we already said we're going to use it for a lot of different parts in training as well like another one of the things we do with dogs that jump on people we turn that into sitting right so in order to greet somebody you sit you know someone walks up to you you sit you get pet someone walks up to you you sit you get pet so now you're classically conditioned that's the way that people are going to interact with you you know what i'm saying good to go right all right let's move to operant conditioning which is an, another type of learning theory we're going to be using with our dogs and this one is uh you know we may take a second to hash this out because this is super important it's also misunderstood mm. by a lot of people right operant conditioning has four pieces to it four quadrants right it's based on the use of consequences uh, that are either good or you know bad or uh, the consequences are direct or indirect right um, but within operant conditioning four quadrants there's no emotion applied so you're not <laughs> getting angry you're not getting frustrated it is what it is right it is what it is in these four quadrants we have some terminology we're going to be using uh, let's just go through it real quick we're going to be talking about the word positive the word positive in operant conditioning and operant terms does not mean good or positive in the emotional sense right a positive in the emotional sense right <clears throat> positive means that we are adding something it's a plus sign we're plusing adding something to it right the word negative does not mean bad right or emotional negativity right all negative means is that we are removing something subtraction from the situation right subtracting from the equation just think plus and minus sign. So when we're talking about operant conditioning, we like to think about a situation, for example, like let's just say it's us with a dog and we're trying to teach a dog how to sit. That situation is an equation. If we say positive, we're adding something to the situation. We're adding something to the equation, right? Am I overcomplicating this? When we, when we say negative, it's been falling just asleep. Asking Ben for some oh, feedback. Okay. Asking Ben for some feedback. You good, Ben? We good? When we say negative, it means we're removing something from the situation or subtracting something from the equation, right? Another word we're going to be using is reinforcement. Reinforcement means that a behavior is more likely to occur in the future. So when we are reinforcing a behavior in operant conditioning, that behavior is more likely to occur in the future. Good to go. When, we're, when we talk about punishment and operant conditioning, punishment means that a behavior is less likely to occur in the future. Good to go? Makes sense? Yeah. Ben? Makes sense? All right. So, Got some coffee, boys? let's talk about the go? four quadrants. <laughs> Quadrant number one, positive reinforcement. Remember, positive means we're adding something. Reinforcement means that the behavior that we're adding something to is more likely to occur in the future. So when we say positive reinforcement, essentially we're going to mark and reward the desired behavior, right? This is your traditional give food reward, right? The dog's behavior that gets them a reward, such as sitting, is more likely to occur in the future. I hope that makes sense, right? Because you're going to be out there, if you're talking to different people about training, you're going to hear purely positive or positive only, right? They don't Sounds really, good. Sounds good. They don't have an understanding of operant conditioning, how it really works. Positive means we're adding to the equation. Reinforcement means we're reinforcing that behavior. Good to go. And think all of, the, all of these quadrants come together, come together like a puzzle piece. And mm -hmm. so if you do have a trainer that says, I'm only using this quadrant, quadrant. Uh, then they're not using all of the, all of the other quadrants. So right. that's not training. Right, right. <coughs> all right, the next quadrant, quadrant number two. A little mic drop there. Mic drop there. <laughs> Chris is getting amped. <laughs> quadrant number two, negative. Well, I remember the first time I was talking to Chris about operant conditioning. <laughs> Is that Waffle House? Mm -hmm. He had a waffle in his mouth and he almost fell asleep on me. It was but now waffles. look at him. He's getting stacked. <laughs> stacked he's up. getting fired up about it. So, you know, 
repetitions it's, of going through operant conditioning is has it can had, be hard to grasp effect, like I, this stuff is is can be hard to <laughs> to grasp and understand but once you do you 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 can't go back you can't go well back. that's, that's how he important. got the information to you he classically conditioned the waffles to feeding you information is that true, why we go to true. waffle house every saturday <laughs> <laughs> don't tell that don't, don't, Lauren and don't Kelly, they don't li- they don't listen to this <laughs> we do it for the dogs all right so quadrant number one positive reinforcement quadrant number two negative reinforcement remember negative means we are removing something from the situation reinforcement means that behavior is more likely to occur in the future so for example in negative reinforcement we may apply an aversive to the dog then remove the aversive once the dog complies with the desired behavior so what happens is the dog's behavior that stops the discomfort is more likely to occur in the future example we're teaching a dog how to sit we tighten a leash with a training collar right so we just gent- gentle tension on that leash as soon as the dog sits we slack the leash boom we have now reinforced the sit behavior because when the dog sat we immediately slack the leash removing all tension from the dog from the situation negative reinforcement does that make sense now some people listening they may start to freak out when we talk about applying aversives right we're going to go through learning theory today there is a process about how to apply these uh, quadrants appropriately Mm -hmm. at different stages in training i don't recommend at the beginning of training you go out and you start applying aversives to your dog that's not the way that we recommend to do it right we're just simply providing information on operant conditioning today and we'll talk about that in a later episode about how you would progressively apply these uh, different quadrants at different times in training. But you do need to understand what operant conditioning is, what the four quadrants are, and understand the terminology that's used for each quadrant. Am I right or am I right? (laughs) Well, if those are the only options, you're right. (laughs) (laughs) All right, the next quadrant, quadrant number three. This one's going to scare some people. Bring it on. Positive punishment. Oh, my God. (laughs) Remember, the word positive means we are adding something to the equation. Remember, the word punishment means that the behavior is less likely to occur in the future. Right? So, when we're talking about punishment and operant conditioning, you can't think of it like... Taking off your belt. (laughs) Right. Taking off your belt, smacking a dog with your belt or your newspaper. We don't recommend that either. Right? No. We're talking from a purely scientific operant conditioning viewpoint right here positive punishment positive means we add something to the situation punishment means that uh, whatever we added is going to make whatever that behavior is less likely to occur in the future so this is going to be the traditional correction in dog training you know what i'm saying the dog's behavior that preceded the correction is less likely to occur in the future so let's say someone's walking with their dog in heel position the dog walks ahead of that person the, the, the handler, the person walking the dog, says no, tugs on the leash or pops on the leash. The dog comes back to proper heel position, good to go. So the handler in that moment applied positive punishment when the dog broke heel position. Does that make sense? So disobeying heel position or walking out away from heel position, that was punished by saying no, tugging on the leash. That was what was added to the equation, the positive piece. The dog backs up back into heel position. Good to go, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Bunny, we good? All right. Negative punishment is your fourth quadrant, right? Negative punishment. Negative means what? We remove something from the situation. Punishment means that a behavior is less likely to occur in the future. So with negative punishment, the withholding of rewards or removing of rewards from the situation until the desired behavior is achieved is a great example, right? The dog's behavior that took the reward away is less likely to occur in the future. So let's say, for example, we have someone uh, with a dog. They ask the dog to sit. They have a piece of food in their hand. The dog's not sitting. So the handler puts the food behind their back. Now the dog sits, right? So negative punishment. I had the food in my hand. I asked the dog to sit. The dog does not sit, so I take the food away. I put it behind my back. Negative, I have removed the food, put it behind my back, punishing the refusal to sit. Now the dog sits. Now the food can come back out, and I can give it to the dog. 
but that takes me into positive reinforcement, right? That quadrant. So in that example, we're flowing through multiple quadrants at the same time in the same situation within seconds of each other. But the key here is negative punishment, the withholding of rewards or removing something the dog desires, right? Uh, so with that being said, in my opinion and my, my, uh, belief, a really good trainer is going to be able to navigate these uh, quadrants very easily, very precisely, very quickly because they understand what's going on in the situation, what the end goal is with that dog, right? And what each of these quadrants are going to be doing. Does that kind of make sense? And when each quadrant is going to be appropriate. And when they're appropriate and when it's appropriate to use them, Mm -hmm. right? You're not going to take a dog on day one and start applying positive punishment. Right. Right. Uh, well, <laughs> well, other than that, just be positive reinforcement. There depends. depends. Well, depends. the thing is about people that say they're they're just purely positive reinforcement. They are using other quadrants. They just yeah. don't right. realize. They don't realize what they are. they are. Yeah, they might be yelling at a dog, screaming mm-hmm. at him, telling him no. Or even I've seen them withhold, withholding food. <laughs> withholding food. <laughs> withholding food. Withholding food. Right. Now you're new, using negative punishment. Right. You know. What I'm but saying? they're still using. <laughs> Just positive reinforcement. Right, right. So that's that's the issue. Right. You know, bad information, bad understanding of information. Right. But it know. sounds good. So you have people that decide to go with that. Right, right. You know, like, oh, yeah, I like that because it sounds good. Yeah. But you need to know, you need to know all this kind of stuff when, yeah. you're, when you're looking for Chris a Chris is ranting right now. Chris is, oh Chris is going off. Let okay. it out, Chris. Let, me Let it off your chest. I'm like, yeah, there's a soapbox under there. <laughs> is it? It's because I'm short. You can't really tell. <laughs> So anyway, operant conditioning, extremely important to understand. A good trainer is going to know how to navigate through these quadrants very easily, very precisely. They understand the quadrants. If you have them come over to you for a consultation, they should be able to detail to you very quickly yeah. and effectively. Just ask them that. Just the say, quadrant. hey, tell me about operant conditioning. <laughs> that's that's, that's hey, all you hey, need to do. I'll filter them out for you real quick. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> see, Ben gave me the podcast stats this weekend, and uh, we got people listening from all over the place. So if you're... If you're listening to this and uh, you're talking to dog trainers, ask them this question when they walk into the, when they walk into your house for a consultation. What quadrants? What of quadrants of operant conditioning are you using? I dare you to ask that question. <laughs> yeah. Let us know. Yeah. Give me some feedback. Yeah. <laughs> if they ask what that is, then. if they ask what that is, just or they tell don't them to turn around and get the yep, hell so, out of your house. Right, see you later. <laughs> see you next time. <laughs> all right. So that's operant conditioning, super important. It's also happening all the time, whether or not you want it to or not, right? Your dog's being reinforced, your dog's being positively reinforced, negatively reinforced, positively uh, punished, or negatively punished, whether or not you're involved, right? Let's say they're out in the yard, they're sniffing around, and they bite a bee. That bee stings them. They just got positive punishment, right? (laughs) (laughs) So that had nothing to do with you, you know what I'm saying? But uh, that makes the behavior of snapping at bees less likely to occur in the future, but it doesn't mean it's not going to occur. You know what I'm saying? Some dogs have... Do you want to explain what that would be then? What the positive punishment there is? Well, dog eating a bee, right? Bee stings a dog. So the bee sting has been applied to the situation, and right, the dog's behavior of eating that bee has been punished. Which means it's less likely, less to, occur. likely to occur. The next the time, he's not going to eat the bee. Right. Not necessarily, right. but yeah, it's right. less right. likely to occur. Well, right. You do it a couple times. It's going to take multiple repetitions. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Multiple repetitions. Uh, waiting for right. Zidane to find a bee. So far, he <laughs> sniped a butterfly yesterday. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Those might taste good. But, I mean, you think like this is this is also happening to us as well, day oh, yeah. in and day out. You, mm-hmm. know, oh, yeah. you think about the way our cars are set up. You get inside of the car. Oh, yeah. What happens? You start driving. You don't put your seatbelt on. Beep, dang. Beep, beep, ding, 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 ding. All right, fine. I'll put my seatbelt on. Right, that is the aversive right there. Yeah. Right. So, our yeah. food's too hot. Food's too, too hot. hot. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Exactly. I, I, I just still need more to film. You know? I still need more reps on that one. <laughs> <laughs> or you know, you do a good job. You get some Oreos at the end of the day if you're Chris. I've not, not done a good job in a long time then, because you ain't given me Oreos in a while. <laughs> <laughs> so operant conditioning is working all the time for all mammals and we are mammals we are yep good to go so all right let's talk about uh, <laughs> quick, quick little factoid i think <laughs> been like that <laughs> let's talk about extinction real quick okay like dinosaurs <laughs> could be 
could be like dinosaurs. Technically, that was the removal of a, you know. <laughs> but in this case, we're talking about behavior, extinction of behavior. Mm. So extinction is when uh, a behavior is no longer reinforced to the point where it is no longer occurring. So this is sometimes a training goal. Sometimes it's a training goal, mm-hmm. right? Sometimes it's a training goal. So, for example, uh, you know, uh, doorbells. You want to <laughs> extinguish the crazy behavior going after the doorbell or going after the door. Do you know what I'm saying? Or uh, let's say you got a dog who's being trained to sit, right? They're not being reinforced to sit, you know? So the behavior, uh, the sitting behavior is going to go away. It's You're saying a dog away. that already knows sit and has been trained to sit, but now it's no longer being reinforced right, over right. time. Exactly. Which we're going to talk about next, how we're going to maintain that over time. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, I mean, you can extinguish any behavior. You know what I'm saying? Let's say another example, you're rewarding a dog for downing. Then you stop rewarding the dog for downing. Just, you just, you know, cold, cold, uh, stop it. Stop it cold. Cold turkey. Cold turkey. Cold turkey. Yeah. Cold turkey. Cold. Let, him, let him work through it. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know why, but I just wanted to say cold cook. Stop. I don't know. I mean, that's close. <laughs> Deli. Yeah. You know, it's fine. Cold cuts. Tur- cold cut. Yeah. Cold turkey. Yeah. <laughs> Cold turkey, stop, right? Stop rewarding the down. The dog uh, might down for some time, and then the dog's going to stop downing. So when the dog stops downing, that behavior is considered extinct, right? So just something to know there. Mm-hmm. Right? So that's a good reason to why we want to continue to reinforce our behaviors, right? Well, and some behaviors, let's you don't say digging, to. digging in your backyard. <laughs> your you may want to extinguish. Themselves. You may want to extinguish that behavior. You want to extinguish it. Yep, you want to extinguish it. So one thing to pay attention to when it comes to extinguishing behavior and anything else is environmental awareness or situational awareness. You have to be situationally aware of what's going on in the environment all the time so your dog does not become reinforced or punished unintentionally from the environment. Mm. Right? So you don't want things around you reinforcing behavior. Like let's say you're walking your dog down the street. Your dog sees another dog. Your dog starts reacting. Guess what? Now your dog is reinforced about reacting at other dogs because it makes them feel good, right? Same thing with the uh, bee situation or like a (laughs) snake situation or whatever. Your dog could be punished unintentionally from the environment uh, by those types of things getting them. And that could actually make your dog uh, want to stop going to certain places, you know, certain areas of the yard, you know, uh, different places you like to go to your, your dog may not want to go there anymore because they're, they've been punished without you even knowing about going there. Could be a loud noise. Even, you know, Mm -hmm. you take your dog somewhere you want to hang out with them. A loud noise occurs. Your dog no longer wants to go there because it associates that with that situation, that environment. Right. And so now you're working against that. You know what I'm saying? So good to go with that. Right. Didn't overcomplicate it. Good to go. (laughs) All right. So let's talk about reinforcement schedules. Uh, which a reinforcement or you can call it a reward schedule is how often we reward a behavior. So, and you're going to change this depending on what level of progression you're at with your dog and your dog's training, right? So we got three schedules we're going to use. Number one, we're going to use a continuous reinforcement schedule, which means we're basically going to reward every single repetition of what we're building on a consistent basis, right? And this is going to be used at the beginning of training and during the foundational stages of training. So let's just take that sit, for example. We're teaching a dog how to sit. Every time they sit, we're going to say good reward, good reward, good reward, good reward. Good we're saying go. good doing the reward. Right. We're, we're not the saying next song. good reward. Good pause reward. Good pause <laughs> reward. Good pause <laughs> reward. <laughs> Good pause reward. <laughs> All right. So, so anyway, consistent, continuous reinforcement. We're rewar- we are rewarding every single repetition. So every time the dog sits, good pause reward, right? The next reinforcement schedule we're going to be using is interval reinforcement schedule, right? And this means we're going to reward frequently, right? But not every single time. So this could be every three repetitions, Every five repetitions, every four repetitions, every three repetitions, every five repetitions, every four repetitions. So So anyway, you are going to change up the interval or the repetitions that you're awarding. Does that make sense? So we ask our dog to sit. They sit. We say good. We don't provide a reward. We start walking around again. 
we say sit, they sit. We say good, we don't provide a reward. Walk around again. The third time we say sit, they sit. We say good, pause, reward. Now we deliver them a reward. Now we're on an interval reinforcement schedule. So we're getting away from the continuous reinforcement. Right, and at that point with the continuous, you you got your classical conditioning too. So they hear right. good, they still feel like, right. you know, mm-hmm. they got Absolutely. that reward. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, good point, good point. Um, then the last one, you got your random reinforcement schedule. This is how you're just going to maintain behaviors, right? So when you're on a random reinforcement schedule, you're basically completed with that aspect of training. You're going to uh, issue your rewards whenever you see fit. You're essentially playing the lottery system or your dog's playing the lottery system, right? And this is just how you're going to maintain behavior. So that could be every three repetitions, every five repetitions, every 10 repetitions. Could be back to back. Could be back to back. You're just changing it up however you want to, right? But the fact that it's random maintains those behaviors at a very high state. Does that kind of make sense? All right. Questions about reinforcement schedules. Ben, are you still with us? He questions? just yawned. Questions? <laughs> no questions. All right. All right. <laughs> He's losing it. <laughs> He's losing it today. He's losing it. He can't hang with this one. <clears throat> All right. So uh, another thing we need to think about is some other factors that do affect uh, some things within conditioning and learning. Number one, hunger drive. How hungry is the dog? How motivated is the dog for food? Because we do want to use food for a key part in building up behavior, right? Uh, we want to use food as an effective reward. We want the dog to, and, and, and in order to do that, the dog has to desire the food being used, <laughs> right? Unfortunately, a lot of dogs today are a little overweight, right? <laughs> So that can they affect got plenty their in, drive. in the storage tank. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm good, bro. Yep, that can affect their hunger drive. Not with all dogs. I mean, we've seen some pretty overweight dogs, and they're loving. They're their still food. ready. They're to loving. Get after it. It. They're ready to get after it. You know, <laughs> I got one, I got one right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the hunger drive of the food of the dog is going to vary, and there are some things we can do to manipulate it as best as possible to make it even stronger. But it is a piece of the puzzle we should be paying attention to, which is the dog's desire for food, right? So good to go with that. But that does matter, right? The size and the amounts of the food that we're using, uh, you know, is going to affect the potency of the reinforcement and the behavior. The food rewards we use that we prefer are going to be about one and a half inch, uh, you know, the pieces are going to be about one and a half inches large. (coughs) Not one and a half, one half. One half. Just a half, half an inch. inch. Half, half an inch. inch. Why do I make that complicated? <laughs> I mean, you're, so, you do use larger rewards than I do. Mine are probably a little well, bit Well, you got small hands. I, I do. I mean, like, yeah. I got, I got big hands. <laughs> so maybe yours are a, an inch and a half. I don't know. Mine are probably half inch. <laughs> <laughs> I got them. <laughs> so food rewards, preferably a half inch. Right size. Smaller dogs might need a quarter inch. My hands are too really big for quarter inch, so it's just <laughs> annoying, you know. I have that smaller screen on my cutter that I use for smaller dogs. Oh, yeah, oh he, my god, it's so yeah. hard to get the little yeah. square. Yeah, just pause right there. For anybody that know wants to know how we make the food rewards, we take like happy howie beef roll, slice it into pieces. We take an onion chopper like Kevin just said. Mm-hmm. Put the happy howie on the onion chopper, chop it up. Yeah. That makes well, it a perfect That's what y'all do. Perfect half inch. I'm still old school, straight up cutting it with hot dogs. Yeah, don't listen to it. Wait, what? The (laughs) the Howies? Yeah. Hey, remember? remember, So time consuming. Whenever Kevin first started training, you remember? Mm. You were like wondering how I made the the food reward so precisely square. (laughs) You're like, how does he do that? Because he's looking at mine and they look like trash. (laughs) (laughs) Then I showed him the onion chopper trick. Good to go. (laughs) So I usually do a like quarter inch slice, and then when I run it through, it makes like a nice little cube. Yeah, it's like, yeah. I like between a half and a quarter. I'm not exact with it. I'm yeah. just kind of running. Yeah, I mean, sometimes the cubes are bigger Yeah, for me. Just depends. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you use huge rewards. <laughs> then you got to wait for a small dog to chew it yeah. and finish. Yeah. Like, like, I'm working with a Yorkie right here. That's not going to fly, bro. <laughs> hey, let me might want him a big, big square, big cube oh, of a reward. He wants him. He wants him. He's got to earn him. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we're going to be using about, again, half inch pieces of food rewards. But there are going to be times for excellent performance. You can jackpot your dog, which is basically giving them multiple pieces versus a single piece. Right? So you can use jackpots at certain points in time. That plays into the amount. You increase the amount for really good behaviors. That's going to help you build up that behavior. Right? All right. 
We already talked about timing a little bit, but just remember timing super important. You don't want to wait too long after you mark a behavior to reward it. It should be within reason, right? And then uh, consistency. So you do want to be consistent with your uh, consequences, whether you're uh, reinforcing a behavior or punishing it from a operant conditioning, you know, terminology perspective, right? So especially during the foundational pieces of training, you want to be consistent. If you're not consistent, there's going to be a lack of learning and understanding on your dog's perspective, right? So if you stay on those reinforcement schedules that we talked about, you're going to be on the path to success, to greatness, to greatness. <laughs> All right. So operant conditioning, anything else you guys want to touch on any of that stuff we talked about with operant conditioning, anything that we may have missed? Uh, I, I would harp on the timing so a lot of times, like I've talked to people and it's like, they have a general knowledge of what they're doing. And like, I'm doing all of this stuff that you're talking about, mm -hmm. trying to t teach my dog and I'll watch them do repetitions. And a lot of time the timing is off. That's mm -hmm. why this, like you can see people will get stuck mm -hmm. in certain phases, especially if you're in that, let's, I've seen people get stuck in like a continuous, uh, oh, yeah. reinforcement, Dangerous. Right? You're always giving them a treat. Now, guess what? Danger zone. Your dog expects that every single time yeah. it can be hard to break that cycle but timing is super super important make sure you're going for that that one half second make sure you're timing that behavior properly to achieve proper classical conditioning mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. same thing with operant though so like if your dog you know says no sit to the point to where you can implement uh positive punishment you know to mm -hmm. to allow this sit to occur you tell them to sit they don't sit you say no and then you wait a few seconds. Mm -hmm. The dog's looked to the left. He's looked up, whatever the case may be. Then you correct him. Well, what are you correcting him for? You know, Because yes. he, he, he can't look up now. So now, right. you know, dogs very much live in the moment. So we need to be, yep. uh, same thing with classical conditioning. We need to make sure that that, that amount of time is limited. One yeah. half second. Yeah. You yeah. know, deliver what you need to deliver. And that's our human tendency to give give them the benefit right. of the doubt. Come you know on, what I'm saying? Oh, come on, come on. You don't want to <laughs> throw a little reminder dog. in there. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> bottom line, like if you are, if your timing is consistent, you're going to correct less because because of classical conditioning being mm -hmm. being put in place later on down the road. You're not going to have to give as many corrections. Yeah, exactly. That's something I see. I, I just was working with someone last week. They're saying no. They're giving inconsistent corrections, mm -hmm. and the corrections are not effective. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, hey, if you apply the correction effectively for the situation consistently now, you're going to have to do less corrections later. Right. So let's take care of it right now. <clears throat> we won't be doing it as much later. But you, you know do it saying? inconsistently, you're going to be doing it forever. Yep. 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 Exactly. All right. So let's talk about something else we need to know about in training, which is learned irrelevance. This is basically when a dog is overexposed to a, to a cue, for example, <coughs> or a command and learns that, that command is irrelevant because exposure to the command has proven uneventful. So a very common example of this is a uh, dog owner that says, sit. No, sit. No, sit. Or but no, no, just sit, 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 yeah. or, sit. Or heel. Heel, 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 you know. If you guys didn't know, this is a pet peeve of ours. <laughs> <laughs> so you're basically undoing that command. You know what I'm saying? There's no consequence. There's no reinforcement. There's no punishment. So the dog is learning that command is uneventful, and you're basically teaching your dog to ignore the command. Right. So be very consistent, be very careful. And again, when you're building up behaviors, you do need to follow a progression that systematically builds up all these behaviors. But once you're in your maintenance phase, you definitely don't want to be performing any type of learned irrelevance, right? Repeating commands, re repeating things without any type of consequence, right? Apply this to your kids. Kids apply and, and stop your spouses. Repeating, stop repeating commands. Your spouses. Hey, <laughs> That's what my mom did. Spouses. Said it one time, <laughs> boom, shoe comes flying at your face. Punishment. <laughs> Positive punishment. <laughs> pure Puerto Rican fashion. <laughs> for my parents, right. for my parents, they used a lot of uh, negative reinforcement. Oh, yeah. A lot of restrictions. Yeah. Yeah. Taking things away. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of positive punishment. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> actually, it wasn't. I had a good balance. Actually, actually, I just got it wrong. My parents didn't use negative reinforcement. They used negative punishment. Negative mm -hmm. punishment. That's they right. They took away things that I wanted, like my phone, yeah. my free time. Your front door. Mm -hmm. My front. <laughs> your front. That was Ben. Your bedroom door. Your bedroom, bedroom door. Ben got the bedroom door ripped off the hinges. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So another thing we need to know about is uh, learned helplessness. 
This is when a dog stops responding in a situation where it has no option to avoid either positive punishment or negative reinforcement. A learned helplessness response is when the event is both traumatic and outside of the dog's control. Dogs that are exposed to unpredictable or uncontrollable punishment are at risk of developing learned helplessness disorder. Positive punishment that is administered without conjunction with a known cue or behavior, mm. such as uh, taking place long after the event, they meet the criteria of inescapable trauma. A classic example of this is a dog who has pottied in the house. Sometime later, the potty is discovered by the owner, Hours. and the dog is reprimanded, either physically or verbally or both. Thus, the dog creates a learned helplessness response around the owner. It is also possible for mental disorders and clinical depression to onset as a result of learned helplessness. And we did do a podcast episode on this. Yep. A while ago. Yeah. I think it's up there, right? Learned helplessness. Yep. I think it was one of the first yeah, ones I did. talked about it. Yeah. yeah. So. Now, here's another situation. You got, you're working with a dog trainer. The dog trainer... Day one brings out an e collar again. So it's not Canine Revolution dog training. It's not Canine Revolution. We did a we did a po- we did a podcast about remote collar stuff, but so you know it's not Canine Revolution. Yeah, but again, you know they're doing it improperly. So they bring out a remote collar day one, put it on your dog, start start applying uh, corrections with a remote collar. Right, dog has no idea what's going on. You can induce learned helplessness training mm-hmm. that way. Yeah, right. So something to pay attention to if you're out there. You're looking for a dog trainer to start working with. Take this information. Use it yep. in your search for a dog trainer that's good for you, right? But you want to stay away from learned helplessness. This is not going to help you. This is not going to help your dog. Unfortunately, we see a lot of dogs that have had this happen with them, and we have to, we're working against that to rebuild up that dog, rebuild up their mentality, their mind, their confidence. You know what I'm I saying? Mean, we've, and it may not even be a remote caller. Like we've had – people come to us that have done consultations with other trainers that they'll bring out a prong collar or some type of choke chain collar and put a lot of aversive on a lot of pressure on a dog day one just for a consultation they're not mm-hmm. even training the dog yeah you know and that's that's how you can you can incite some of this learned helplessness yeah so yeah. be mindful of that stuff so the actual event doesn't take long you yeah. know to cause that traumatic response but then rehabilitating those behaviors later mm-hmm. you got a long road ahead of you mm-hmm. yeah. you know absolutely absolutely all right, so let's talk about another, and this is not really talked about that much, <coughs> but it's super, impor- super important to understand, right, and which is uh, escape and avoidance training, right? When we talk about escape and avoidance training, this is something in dog training that involves aversion or pressure, right? Escape refers to negative reinforcement, right? So here we're learning to escape something unpleasant with their behavior, Avoidance refers to, you know, positive punishment, avoiding something unpleasant with behavior, right? So there's a lot of dog trainers out there that are using purely escape and avoidance training. They won't tell you that, but Mm -hmm. they are, you know what I'm saying? So this is why it's important to ask your dog trainer, what quadrants of operant conditioning are they using, right? Uh, Because if you're using only escape and avoidance training, and you're using it improperly, which is what you're doing. If that's the only thing you're using, uh, you know, it's not going to help, not going to help your dog in the long run. It's going to create a lot of problems. So basically the reason why you don't want to use strictly escape and avoidance training is because the dogs are going to retain stress from training for a longer period of time. They're going to be under stress, right? And high levels, high levels of stress for longer periods of time. And they're going to accumulate stress very quickly, right? So those are the main reasons why if you're looking for a dog trainer, you want to understand what escape and avoidance training is. And then you do want to understand, you know, if not used properly, what, what can happen? You know what I'm saying? Now, again, like we talked about, there's going to be pieces in training where you're going to use negative reinforcement. You're going to use positive punishment. You need to use those things to build up behaviors hundred percent appropriately. Right. But it's got to be at the right stage of training, the right place, you know. Keyword right appropriately. Yeah. appropriately. You know what I mean? It's yeah. done correctly. Yeah. Absolutely. So all that kind of stuff plays into it. Okay. All right. So last thing, we're going to talk about a couple pieces of terminology 
that we think are important, right? So number one, let's talk about engagement. This is the first thing before we teach anything to a dog. The first thing we're going to do, especially when we talk about progressions in a later podcast, uh, the first thing we're going to do is build up engagement, which is sustained focus and motivation from that dog on us, the handler or the trainer, right? We want a dog that's more interested uh, in us than the environment. You know what I'm saying? So again, day one of training, we're not putting a remote collar on a dog and just start using it. We're not applying aversive pressure on that dog, you know, without the dog understanding what's going on. We're going to be doing engagement, building up a relationship with that dog, building up that dog's focus on us, building up their, their motivation to want to be with us, train, have a good time. Right? So that's one of the first things you want to pay attention to when it comes to, uh, to training, right? Anything to add? I mean, it's almost, it's almost impossible to put into words the power of engagement. It's like you, those of you that have done engagement with your dog know, but like without this critical piece of like the rest of this can fall apart. This is, this is literally the foundation for everything. You're building a relationship with your dog. Your dog wants to be with you. Your dog wants to train, wants to learn new information. That's much different than, Hey, we're forcing them to do things. You know what I'm saying? So this, this stuff is super, super powerful. If you're not doing engagement, you're wrong. Do it. And you're going to use it throughout all aspects of the training. Absolutely. Whether you change it up reward event or, you know, you're working on some distraction socialization work, you know, things like that. So you you start with it, but it Mm -hmm. follows you all the way through the progression. Absolutely. Yeah. You may even get to a part of training. Maybe you're doing some distraction work. Maybe maybe there is a little bit of stress introduced to the dog, Mm -hmm. right? And the dog's getting a little stress. You can always fall back to that that foundational piece, start doing some engagement. Now we're relieving some stress. We're making it a positive experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a crazy powerful tool. Absolutely. So now that Kevin brought up reward event, let's talk about that. Because in I was the, ahead of the game. <laughs> you were ahead of the game, boys. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, back in the day, back in the day when people first started training dogs with food rewards, it was a big belief that the main motivator for a dog to do work was the food reward itself. But with us, we want uh, a reward event, which we're going to build up in that engagement session, right? So in our system, we want to create an interactive reward event which is something that the dog and the handler do together that the dog and the handler find valuable, motivating, and it bonds the two together, right? So for us, essentially at the beginning of training, we're going to have that dog chase us, right? In a playful way, right? In a structured way. And they're going to get food rewards for doing that. We build up eye contact. As soon as they build up eye contact, we get to say yes, which means they're released from that. They chase us. We move very quickly to induce prey drive. They chase us. We offer them a food reward with our hand as we're doing that little chase and then good to go. Right. Then we go into another repetition. That's as simple as I can make it, you know, on a verbal, verbal uh, aspect. It'll be a full sprint if you have a great Dane, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're actually running. Oh, yeah. You're actually running away from yeah. super fast. <laughs> oh, yeah. But But think, too, like as you build this up, you're building the focus on you. It makes every other aspect of once you get into training the behaviors, it makes everything a little easier, Mm -hmm. a lot easier, really, because, you know, your dog's not interested anymore on just sniffing the ground because the ground's not as interesting as as you are because you've done this engagement. Right. Absolutely. So reward event. Anytime you hear us talking about reward event, that's what we're doing. And like, like Chris said earlier, if we're in the middle of a distraction session, let's say we're in Lowe's hardware store, Right. We're in the lumber section. There's some forklifts. There's some lumber getting thrown around. You know, those $100 sheets of plywood are getting <laughs> tossed around, right? That dog's getting a little bit stressed out. We induce some engagement. We release them into a reward event that helps battle that stress level they have in that situation. Yep. Right? It changes the association. Changes mm-hmm. up the association. All right. So with that being said, let's talk about what we call the chemistry of behavior. This is the chemicals that are manufactured and present in the dog's body and brain, especially during stress or high arousal, right? So these chemicals that are related to stress and high arousal are usually going to be adrenaline, cortisol, and endorphins, right? These chemicals have effects on the dog's body and its ability to learn. So if your dog has too much stress or too much high arousal going on, it's going to be ineffective for your dog's ability to learn. So like a lot of dogs, they get super aroused by a chuck it ball, hmm. you know, chasing that chuck it ball, right? So if you try to use that to build up your training, that's going to be ineffective because your dog is in a high arousal mindset, meaning that it's got adrenaline, 
and probably endorphins pumping through its system. They're not thinking the clearest. Dopamine, you know, pumping through its system. It's not going to learn as effectively as if you had a lower arousal food, which would be a food reward. There are going to be dogs that food rewards are oh, super yeah. high arousal. You know what I'm saying? I know Kevin had one recently. I have one right now. <laughs> Start <laughs> which, foaming at the mouth. Which one is it? <laughs> Both. <laughs> Both. <laughs> bring, out, bring out some food rewards. You know, that dog's losing it. I so just want you, the food. I can't yeah. focus on anything. <laughs> yeah, so then you got to use some other type of reward, some other aspect of training to build up the behavior and then in, introduce the food rewards later. Just less yeah. arousing food. Less yeah. arousing food, yeah. yeah. Hey, here's some broccoli. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I like some, I like some good broccoli now. All right, so, uh, you know, we've talked about prey drive before, but let's touch on it real quick. So prey drive is basically a dog's desire to chase and grab things with their mouth. Some dogs are extremely motivated by prey drive. So if they are, we want to harness it, utilize it, manipulate it to teach the dog how to play, use their motivation for work, right? All right, so let's see what else we got here. Something that people need to know about, spatial pressure, right? Very important a tool that you can use when you're teaching your dogs and reinforcing behaviors and spatial pressure is basically using your body to manipulate the dog right so like let's say we want to ask them to sit let's say they're about four feet away from us we say sit they're just staring at us we take one step closer all of a sudden their butt hits the ground they're in a sit we say good provide a reward right so that was using spatial pressure using our body and our distance to them to build up and reinforce behaviors. Super important, right? And it could be something as just like looking at your dog a certain way, right? That can provide some spatial pressure, adjusting your body a certain way in relation to your dog, providing spatial pressure. So these are super important ways to understand and learn how to build up behavior using uh, with a dog, right? I like to use this like in an elevator. Uh-huh. I'll go like I like to stand by the buttons. So oh, if someone's yeah. already by oh, the yeah. buttons, I just get uncomfortably close to them and they go to the other side. Spatial pressure. So, boom. At its yeah. finest. Bam. Good to go. Bingo. Well, if they don't get out of the way, <laughs> then, then it gets weird for me. What if they grab you? But, well, then it's, it's go time. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm getting by the buttons. <laughs> Why do you want to be by the buttons? So I, I like buttons. to hit them all. Like, you know, like you move, move your hand down. It's a, it's a control thing for Chris. He has, to, he has to feel like he has control of the elevator. <laughs> I want to I hit the emergency. Last stop thing button. he wants is a firefighter having to come break him out of an elevator. <laughs> so, I mean, I'll, just, I'll just walk in, look at you, five, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good to go. All right, let's talk about shaping. Shaping is... The creation of behavior. So behaviors can be free shaped or they can be assisted with other forms of manipulation to complete the shape behavior. Is that luring? Could be be learn. Could be spatial pressure. Right? We want to shape the dog into performing desired behaviors. Some behaviors shape very quickly. Others, not so quickly. Right? Depends on the dog. Depends on the situation. Depends if you're Mike Ritlin. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Good to go. (laughs) So let's just talk about free shaping really quickly. Free shaping is essentially allowing your dog to figure out the desired behavior in order to access a reward. When you are free shaping behavior, the behavior that you're building up must be marked and rewarded consistently. This is going to take more time to complete. However, it can be mixed with physical manipulation and luring and other forms of, uh, you know, manipulation to achieve the desired behavior. So for me personally, I'll usually use a mixture of luring, spatial pressure. We're saying leash, luring, by the way, like when you lure somebody with food. I'm going to need a shirt with like me fishing on it. This lure. Is lure. I we, got, we got a fishing video that we're planning. <laughs> I've been luring some with, stuff. Kevin, luring. Stand, stand by. Luring some gators. Stand by. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that is shaping. Successive approximation is basically taking a behavior, rewarding it along the way, baby stepping it until a full behavior is achieved, right? So let's take a down, for example. Not every dog wants to lay down the first time you do it, right? It's actually pretty rare. So what you can do is... It's succ- nice when it happens. Though. Yes, like, nice oh, when it yes. What, This what, is going to be a good day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what you can do is successively approximate the pieces of downing. So you may get, you know, the dog just to go down just a little bit, you know? Good. Reward, you yep. know? Dog goes halfway down, good, reward. Dog goes all the way down, good, reward. You know, keep going. Moves a paw forward in the right direction. Ooh, keep building it up. You know, keep building Slow it up. Slow and steady. All right, a couple more here. All right, 
uh, superstitious association. This is when your dog associates an unpleasant experience with something other than what you intended. This is most likely going to happen, right, during remote collar training if it's not done properly, right? So, again, we put, if we're the type of people, which we're not, if, if you're working with somebody that puts a remote collar on day one, starts using it, guess what? You're probably going to incur superstitious association with the remote collar, mm-hmm. thus making a collar-wise dog, thus making your training horrible yeah. and more complicated, right? And your dog won't be able to operate with the collar off of it, right? And then when you send us, we got to desensitize the collar, and it's this whole whole thing. We'll still take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll do it. We'll do it. Yep. So, uh, you know, let's say, for example, uh, you know, the dog is focused on something other than what you wanted, right? Some type of... Uh, consequence occurs some type of uh, punishment is induced right in operant terms that could trigger a uh, superstitious association so let's say you're working with someone they put a remote collar on your dog they ask your dog to sit the dog's looking at a tree that's right next to them you know the dog's not sitting so they apply the uh, remote collar correction the dog feels that sensation improperly now the dog could associate that tree to that Right. Mm-hmm. Or you or the trainer you're working with or whoever, you know what I'm saying? So just, just come to us and let us, let us uh, work with you on your remote collar stuff. Okay. All right. Then last but not least under stimulation, mm. this is when your dog is given insufficient opportunity to use and develop its inborn abilities and satisfy its instinctual needs. This is why mental and physical stimulation on a daily basis are needed to prevent under stimulation from occurring mm. good to go mm. right is that a wrap is that a, any questions or comments boys i mean we see it all the time under stimulation root cause of a lot of behaviors yep. yeah absolutely so wow learning while uh learning theory is very important to understand there's no one way to train a dog that's why as a good dog trainer as a balanced dog trainer you got to understand all this stuff and more Understand how to maneuver through different pieces of operant conditioning, classical conditioning, other things we've talked about today, right? Every dog's different. You're going to have to apply multiple aspects of learning theory in order to effectively work with whatever dog's at hand with you, right? But we do have our overall progression, how to get from point A to, or from start to finish with dogs in general, you know what I'm saying? So important stuff here. Probably listen to this a couple times. If you're into it, for some of you, this may have been too much, too sciencey. That's okay. But you just got to keep we listening to you. it. The more you listen to it, the more it makes sense. Don't worry. I just had to go through this like 200 times with Chris before we finally yeah. got into it. <laughs> Only took Kevin five times, but me, <laughs> it was. I was just doing it for the waffles, though. Let's just be real. <laughs> Let's just be real. Good to go. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, we appreciate all you listeners out there. Thanks for tuning in today. Please leave us some feedback in the comments below if you're watching us on YouTube. Or if you're listening to us on your favorite podcasting platform, leave us a review. Let us know how we're doing. We appreciate the support. And until next time, out.